thank you very much for your, your kind words and um, it's great to be with you today um, up from Melbourne where it's a public holiday so you can see that I'm really committed to uh, helping you guys in the not-for-profit sector. It's one of the passions uh, of mine and fits nicely with my specialty in terms of fringe benefits tax um, but really pleased to be here with you today so thanks for having me along. So the idea of this morning is to talk you through some of um, the issues to do with fringe benefits tax and salary packaging in your sector and really to look at ways of maximising the concessions that are available to you guys at the moment as well as trying to look forward to what we might be expecting in the future. I'm quite happy by the way for anybody who wants to raise any questions to do so throughout the presentation so if you want to just yell out or put your hand up um, let me know and, and we'll deal with the questions as we go through and if there are too many questions and it gets out of control I'll sort of pull you back but um, let's deal with it as we go along if we can. So uh, in terms of the agenda for this morning uh, what I thought I would do is go through the FBT treatment and, and eligibility for concessions for different organisations. So hopefully most of you are aware of the concessions that are available and where your organisation fits but just to talk a little bit about that and, and where we might be heading in the future with that as well. We'll go through some specific fringe benefits tax concessions for the not-for-profit sector and how you might be utilising those and where there might be some that you're not utilising that, that you can. <coughs> we'll look at um, specific salary packaging benefits, um, the particular benefits that are useful in the not-for-profit sector, as well as then some practical issues about how to do things simply, keeping the admin easy, all those sorts of issues. Um, and also look at the impact of reportable fringe benefits as well, which people sometimes forget about in terms of looking at the tax savings to do with fringe benefits tax, but what are the other impacts particularly related to reportable fringe benefits. And then finally, uh, I'll talk about some of the not-for-profit sector reform issues that are happening, particularly in the FBT space. I might actually skip to some of that as we go through, just where it's relevant to what we're talking about, but we'll pick up on any of the things that we haven't covered uh, at the end as well. So to start off with, in terms of who's eligible for what, and uh, I thought I'd start with the best concession. So this is uh, who's el eligible for the FBT exemption. So there's a list there. Hopefully you know if your organisation fits into one of those lists. Um, the important thing to note really there, I think, is the difference between whether you're qualifying for a 30,000 cap uh, in grossed up benefits that can be provided exempt to your employees or whether you're restricted to the $17,000 cap. So hopefully you can see from that list um, where you fit if you are a, a, an FBT exempt employer. One of the issues I wanted to point out here, um, as I mentioned before, I might skip forward to some of the reform that we might be expecting. This is one point where I'd like to do that. Um, the not-for-profit sector tax concession working group um, that I'm sitting on uh, is reporting to the Treasurer this month. And the idea of reporting this month, by the way, is that hopefully any recommendations that want to be picked up in the uh, federal budget, there's enough time for costing, etc. So some of them might be able to come through in the budget. Um, others might be longer term suggestions. But one of the issues that we've been looking at is who qualifies for which concession and should we stick with this list of organisations as eligible for the FBT exemption? Or do we need some refinement around this list and also the next list that we'll look at as well in terms of FBT rebate? Um, are there organisations that should switch from one to the other? Should we just have one tier of, of concession rather than the two tiers that we have at the moment? And even are there organisations who currently don't get any fringe benefits tax concession that should fall into either a one-tier or a two-tier system for concession. So this is something that might move in the future. It's not necessarily something that would be picked up straight away in the budget. Um, you know, and I don't have any inside information on that, obviously. That's purely for the government to decide um, what they want to do with, uh, in terms of announcements in the budget. Um, but I would guess that this is something that needs a bit sort of uh, more longer-term consideration about who really should be eligible for what. Um, another area of reform that I'll mention at this point straight away as well is, uh, or potential for reform, is the ability for employees at the moment to access multiple caps. So if you're uh, employed by a number of different organisations, you could at the moment qualify for either the 30,000 or the 17,000 cap for exempt benefits. Uh, at each of those employers. So this is certainly something that the working group's been looking at and thinking about whether we need to refine that process so that employees can actually only access one cap for the FBT year. 
Um, the whole purpose of, or the, or the guiding principles of the working group are really to look at the current envelope of tax concession support provided to the sector, and is there a better way that we can provide that support? So is fairer ways, simpler ways, more effective ways? So if, for instance, the multiple caps issue was addressed and employees could only access one cap, that actually um, provides a pool of money that can then be distributed to the sector in a different way, hopefully a fairer, simpler, more effective way. And the, all the reforms need to be uh, revenue neutral. So um, don't think about them as just taking things away. There's actually a hand back at the same time. Question. No, they haven't. I only haven't included them there because it's not a blanket exemption for the organisation itself, for the religious practitioners. In fact, I'll flick over to the next page now because that's top of the list on the next one, and it's a common area of confusion. So a religious institution at the moment would qualify for the rebate of FBT along with the other organisations listed there. But to the extent that there are religious practitioners providing services in relation to you know, their, their duties as a religious practitioner, then they would qualify specifically for the exemption. But it is important to remember that other employees within the organisation don't get the exemption. It's only the rebate available to them. So this is not an exhaustive list as well for the FBT rebate now. Um, but this is a fairly extensive list of who would be covered under this category. So the main issues that I wanted to point out here, uh, if you fall into the category for FBT rebate in a salary packaging context, is that it's really only going to be tax effective for employees to salary package benefits with the FBT rebate to the extent that they're earning above 80,000 taxable income. That's using today's tax rates and tax thresholds. Technically there is a saving below 80,000 of taxable income, but it's so small that you wouldn't bother. So for instance, if you think about somebody packaging the whole, let's call it $16,050 worth of fringe benefits that grosses up to the 30,000 cap, um, they would need to give up the 16,050 for the benefits plus about another 7,000 for the FBT applicable to those benefits. So roughly 22,000 out of their, their total remuneration package. So if that person's earning, let's say, $102,000, that's 22,000 more than that 80,000 cap, it makes sense to package in that scenario. Well, it probably makes sense, ignoring all other sorts of issues that we'll talk about later. But if the person's on a salary of, let's say, $90,000, it doesn't really make sense to package right down below the 80000 However, they still could, because it's not going to put them in a negative position from a tax perspective. There'll be a marginal saving below the 80000 So, for instance, if you're on 90000 you could give up the whole twenty-two for 16000 of benefits. But if you're on 80000 you probably wouldn't. Why would you give up $22,000? you are not going to really get that much saving from it. It's probably not worth entering into the, the arrangement. Does that make sense? A few nods. Um, so uh, from a rebatable employer perspective, what I often find is that there are not a lot of employees in the organisation earning more than $80,000. So it's not necessarily a great idea to introduce a fantastic policy about all these benefits that you can package when the employees aren't really going to benefit from it because their salaries aren't high enough to get any saving. In that scenario, it probably makes sense to look more on a case-by-case -case basis at the individuals who could get a benefit from the arrangement. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's the organisations that qualify for the FBT concessions. Next thing I thought we'd move to is the specific concessions for benefit types that are relevant to the not-for-profit sector. And really there are three main ones to tick off on. So meal entertainment, entertainment facility leasing expenses, which I like to call venue hire, and car parking fringe benefits. So we'll talk about each of these. Particularly in relation to the car parking benefits, I've listed there the organisations that get a specific exemption from FBT for car parking. So this is something to be aware of if you're a public benevolent institution, hospitals, ambulance services, health promotion charities, scientific institutions, registered charities and public educational institutions. 
So those organisations get the car parking benefit. It's interesting to note that there are a couple of organisations in there that don't necessarily get any FBT rebate even for the organisation, but still qualify for this car parking exemption. Perfect example, a university established by a uh, law uh, or a, a statute, so it doesn't qualify for rebate of FBT, pays full rates of FBT, but because it's a public educational institution will get this car parking exemption. So just to point out really, I guess there, that it doesn't always match the FBT concessions that are available to the organisations as, as an organisation. So first of all, meal entertainment. Um, and so this is something that can be salary packaged in an FBT exempt organisation with no limit on the amount of uh, benefits to be packaged and still qualify for that exemption. And same thing in a rebatable organisation, so the rebate is, is unlimited. But again, remember, as I mentioned, if you're a rebatable organisation, it really only makes sense to package these things above that 80,000 threshold. So what's included? There's a great big long ruling from the tax office that talks about what's entertainment. It's pages and pages and there's lots of examples. So if you've had any trouble sleeping lately, get hold of um, TR, sorry I flicked over without meaning to, TR 9717 and have a read. Uh, it talks about a what, when, where and why test. And I think it's relevant to have a bit of a chat about these because more and more questions come up as employees are packaging these items about what actually qualifies um, for the concession. So the what test is about what food and drink is actually provided. It's more likely to be entertainment if it's a three course meal with alcohol. It's much less likely to be entertainment if it's just sandwiches and juice. If you then go to the where test, that's about is it on the business premises or is it off the business premises? So if it's off the business premises, it's much more likely to be entertainment, whereas if it's on the business premises, it's more likely not to be. Now these are not black and white tests obviously, but they're more likely versus not so likely tests and you need to look at it on balance. So that's the what and the where. The when is when is the benefit provided? Is it within business hours or is it outside of business hours? So again, in business hours, more likely not entertainment. Outside of business hours, more likely to be entertainment. And the final one is the why, which is actually probably the most important test. Why is this benefit provided? Is it because it's the time of day and you need a meal? Or is it actually to entertain the recipient? So for instance, if you think about employees buying their lunch every day during, during a work, normal work day, they've got to go and buy their lunch because it's lunchtime and they're hungry and you know, that's more a sustenance sort of need. Whereas if they're going out to a restaurant with a bunch of other people and there's a social flavour, that's more about entertainment. It's not eating just because it's lunchtime, it's actually extending that to the purpose of entertaining. So it's quite subtle, um, but they're the sorts of things that we look at in trying to work out whether something's entertainment or not. And I guess from an employer perspective, in terms of working out what you will allow from a salary packaging uh, or in, as part of your salary packaging process, you need to have some practical rules about what you're going to allow and what you're not going to allow. And I think it's also important to think about the fact that the law was never written with all of this salary packaging in mind. So there's often no perfect answer to a question that an employee asks about is this particular expense allowed from a salary packaging perspective well, was never contemplated by the law so we've just got to look at what we what we have and work out where it fits and that's why all these sort of tests are relevant but you then need to use some sort of practical approach to saying well we'll allow this set of items but we won't allow this set of items because perhaps it's too hard with those ones to work out whether they are actually entertainment or not. So a couple of examples are up on the board there um, on the slide. Restaurant meals, uh, dining, are generally accepted as entertainment um, because you usually don't go to a, a restaurant just to have your lunch every day. It's more for an, an, an uh, entertainment type or social occasion. Um, the dine-in aspect is about the fact that the timing of the entertainment is kind of important. So if you're dining in, you're being entertained straight away when you purchase your meal, whereas if you purchase a takeaway meal and 
take it away and eat it somewhere else. You're not entertained straight away. The entertainment doesn't happen until later when you're eating it. So, and it's also harder to determine whether that actually is going to be in a social entertainment kind of setting. Um, so that, that's why you'll see a lot of uh, policies that exclude the takeaway meals but just allow the dine-in meals. From a practical perspective, it, it gives the employer some level of certainty about the costs that they're allowing fitting within the rules. Um, catering costs for a party is another example. So it could even be a party at home that you're having catered. So the, the bill for those sort of costs can be uh, packaged as meal entertainment. Um, but you'll see general groceries is on the excluded list. So technically, if you're having a party at home and you go down to the local Woolies to buy your various bits of food and, and grog for the party, that would qualify as meal entertainment. But from an employer's perspective, keeping the, the system practical, it's too hard to distinguish those sort of costs from your general grocery items. So you really can't, from a practical perspective, allow those items, or your whole system just becomes unmanageable. So again, it's another example of where you've just got to have a practical approach and where the law really you know, didn't have these things in mind. Um, so that's the meal entertainment side. The next one was the venue hire, the entertainment facility leasing. So this is, uh, this is something that was introduced in order to keep compliance costs low. So it was actually all about, well, when you have a Christmas party or some other sort of entertainment event, we didn't want the employer to have to work out who was there and which amount of the benefit was going to be reported on each employee's payment summary, et cetera, et cetera. But as a result of the introduction of that exclusion, if you like, it had the flow-on effect that for a not-for-profit, you're always going to be exempt from FBT or qualify for the rebate of FBT on this type of expenditure as well. So again, it's an area where the law wasn't really written with this in mind, but it works for the moment. And I say for the moment because getting uh, on to the reform issue again, I think this is an area where there's a fairly generally uh, accepted view that this wasn't intended and it's an area that's perhaps ripe for reform. Um, and I think that it's quite likely and we haven't, in terms of the not-for-profit sector tax concession working group that I'm on, the recommendations to government haven't been settled yet, but I'm fairly confident that one of the recommendations will be about removing this, this benefit item. So the message today is kind of sorry, <laughs> um, but also make hay while the sun shines, do what you can while the law is still uh, allowing this to happen. And also keep in mind that it's not just taking away, like I said before, it's actually looking at how can we redistribute that benefit in a better, fairer, simpler way. So um, I guess another point to make there too is that if we do see a change, recent history in terms of changes being made by the government has shown that they've tended to allow transitional rules for arrangements that are already in place. So if you put in place an arrangement today for these types of benefits, it's quite possible that any future change in this space will only relate to new arrangements and not existing arrangements at that point. I can't promise that, of course, but that's certainly what's happened with more recent legislative changes that we've seen in the FBT space. So what can you package today in this, in this um, category? Um, basically, we're talking about hiring a facility, uh, which is generally interpreted as accommodation, but it could be function rooms or similar to you know, a room like this. But it's for the purpose of providing entertainment. And the purpose of providing entertainment can be or can fall into basically two categories. It can be for the provision of entertainment by way of food and drink entertainment, or the provision of entertainment by way of recreation. So when we talk about the food and drink entertainment scenario, we're kind of talking about hiring a reception centre or a function room for some sort of party, like a wedding or a 21st or something like that. So it's a big occasion where there's going to be food and drink at social entertainment nature. So the hiring of that facility is uh, a venue hire expense or an entertainment facility leasing cost. The other bracket in terms of recreation <laughs> is about really whether the employee is on holidays and therefore, uh, and, and the tax office accepts that being on holidays is a form of recreation effectively. Um, but also it can include things like sporting activities, um, which 
even more obviously fall into that bracket of recreation, I guess. So that's why I've got higher of tennis courts and squash courts and things like that on the list. There have been some private rulings around those, so the tax office has accepted these as entertainment facility leasing expenses, but also the holiday accommodation. So when you're hiring uh, a rental property or a hotel room or even a caravan or a camping site, any of those sorts of things qualify under this entertainment facility leasing category. Yep. The holiday accommodation doesn't need to be within Australia, is the question. It can actually be overseas as well. So what you'll find there is that you simply have an expense that doesn't have GST in it rather than the Australian one will have GST in it. But, you, um, but yeah, there's no reason why it needs to be within Australia for, for packaging purposes or to qualify for the FBT concession. Okay, I'll move on to the car parking. We've got time for questions at the end too, so if you think of some other things, perhaps jot them down and we'll... Um, We'll get to them at the end of the session as well. In relation to car parking fringe benefits, I mentioned a couple of slides back that certain organisations qualify for a complete exemption from car parking. But if you don't qualify for the exemption from car parking, the issue here is when do you actually have a benefit and have you got an FBT liability and is it something that you could offer under a salary packaging heading? So just from a general perspective and an overarching over, um, perspective, the um, benefit of packaging a car parking arrangement is usually where, well, they, there usually is a benefit from packaging a uh, car parking where the value of the car parking for FBT purposes is less than the cost of the car parking that you're actually paying because then you can see, well, effectively we're paying tax on a value less than what we're actually paying for the benefit. So where that scenario exists, it can be beneficial to offer salary packaging for the car parking. But if the value of the car parking for FBT purpose is going to be the same or higher than what you're paying, there's really not going to be any benefit there. So how do we work this all out and, and what is the value? First of all, you need to look at whether you actually fall within uh, the car parking rules in the first place. And if you're based in the CBD, that's fairly obvious because there'll be somewhere within a kilometre that charges more than the statutory rate for car parking, which at the moment is $7.83 for the day. But if you're out in the suburbs, it can be a little bit more... <laughs> where did the $7.83 come from? <laughs> be nice to only have to pay that. Um, the, uh, that. That actually is an average rate that, based on some statistics that the tax office obtained, so I'm not sure where they're getting all their numbers from. <laughs> if your offices are outside the CBD, the issue is going to be whether there's a commercial parking station within a kilometre that charges more than this daily rate, because as soon as there is, you'll be into the FBT net unless, of course, you've got the specific exemption that we mentioned earlier. So then it comes down to, well, what is actually a commercial parking station? And what we need to look at here is whether the parking station is really offering all-day parking. And there are some parking organisations that are offering parking, but actually on a short-term basis, and they don't want people to, to stay all day, and they charge penalty rates if you do stay all day. So those types of parking stations are not what we call commercial parking stations because they're not truly offering all-day parking. So some examples of both sorts of situations. A car parking station that is a commercial parking station offering all-day parking would be, for instance, one of those um, park and ride places. I think I've got the terminology right. We don't have it in Melbourne yet, but I understand you've got it in Sydney, where you can park near, say, a shopping centre that's near a train station for the day and then catch the train in for the rest of the journey to the city. So that is a scenario where they're truly offering all-day parking. And that would be a commercial parking station. And if they're charging more than $7.83, all the businesses within a kilometre now have an issue in terms of FBT on car parking that they provide to their staff. As another example at the other extreme would be, for instance, a sh another shopping centre or a hospital that offers short-term parking and it maybe has a fee schedule where the uh, price charged for, say, an hourly rate for parking actually increases the longer that you stay. 
and there might be quite a hefty price to pay if you park there all day. So those sorts of parking stations are accepted by the tax office as not commercial parking stations because they don't want you there all day and, and their pricing recognises that. So if you've got one of those types of places nearby, then you don't have to worry about that um, causing you to fall within the FBT net. The next area of confusion that often arises is in terms of uh, where, where you've got a bunch of different parking stations within a kilometre, some that charge more than that threshold rate and some that charge less, and maybe some have a monthly or annual rate that when you work it out to a daily rate is less than that $7.83. Now the, the issue there is that as soon as there's one parking station that charges more than the daily rate, you're into the FBT net. So regardless of the fact that there might be another parking station down the road that charges less than that daily rate. So just the fact that there's one that charges more than the threshold rate puts you into the FBT net. Once you're in the FBT net, the next step is how do you actually value the provision of the parking and that's where you can use the lowest rate within a kilometre. So those different rates within the kilometre are relevant for different reasons. The one that's higher than the $7.83 puts you in the FBT net and the other one that might be lower or the lowest rate within a kilometre is the one that you'll use to actually value the car parking fringe benefit in your FBT return. And that's the one that's the key in terms of the comment I made at the start of this topic that if that value is less than what you're actually paying for the parking, that's where you might see a benefit from providing salary packaging for the car parking. Make sense? Okay. So other salary packaging issues to cover. What I thought I'd do here is give you the kind of list that covers pretty much all the common categories of fringe benefit that you might look at offering from a salary packaging perspective, some of which we've already talked about. Um, the private expenditure at the top of the list is the 16,050 or the 9,000 odd if you're in the hospital sector. Um, that can be um, packaged usually using mortgage, rent, credit card repayments, those sorts of things, um, which I won't go into in detail today. The meal entertainment and the venue hire we've talked about, uh, so, so we've talked about the car parking as well. Novated leases and associate leases are still there as quite uh, tax effective. I'm not going to go into those in detail today, but just to mention that from a not-for-profit perspective, if you're offering the full uh, amount of packaging, say the 16050 on the private expenses, plus the meal entertainment, plus the venue hire, it can be tax effective to offer the car to the employee as well. They might find that it's beneficial to package a car on top of all those other benefits, or for, particularly in the rebateable employer scenario, they might find that it's beneficial to package the car as part of their 16050 That can be the, the best mechanism in terms of how to, to maximise their salary packaging scenario. Um, novated leases you're all probably fairly familiar with. The associate leases, just very briefly, what I'm talking about there is a scenario where the employee's associate, so usually their spouse, but it can be any associate, owns the car or they might hold it under some finance arrangement, a lease or, or other finance arrangement. Typically they'll own the car. They lease the car to the employer who provides it back as a fringe benefit to the employee. We do it as a fully maintained operating lease, so the associate's responsible for all the running costs and the employer just pays that one fully maintained lease payment on a regular basis to the associate. The employee obviously gives up salary to cover the cost of those lease payments to the associate and depending on how they're structuring it as part of their package, they may give up an after-tax contribution to ensure there's no FBT or, for instance, the car might be included as part of their 16,050, so no FBT if they're with an exempt organisation or with rebateable FBT if they're with a rebateable organisation. The benefit of those sorts of scenarios is twofold or can be twofold. One, you get the same type of benefits as you do with the novated lease scenario in that you're into the FBT net You've got the 20% now statutory fraction to apply to the base value of the car and particularly if you're not doing very many kilometres um, and particularly if a high percentage of your usage of the car is private, then that 20% statutory fraction can be quite concessional. So that's one area where the savings can come from. 
The other area is if the associate is not earning any taxable income or has a lower taxable income than the employee, it's kind of an income splitting mechanism because the employee is going to give up salary in lieu of lease payments going to their spouse. So it's kind of shifting income from one to the other. And that income splitting effect can be quite attractive, particularly for the higher paid employees in your organisation, um, obviously where their spouse isn't earning uh, as much income and perhaps none. Grant Thornton has some calculators, by the way, that just help work out the tax savings from these sorts of arrangements, which we don't charge a fee for. So if anyone's interested, um, just shoot me an email and I'll send you back the calculators. Um, it, it's quite complicated for employees to work out whether there's any tax saving from packaging a car or not. So using something like that can be quite useful. As the, um, the salary packaging providers and fleet companies, they all have those sorts of calculators as well. So it's really useful to to um, give your employees access to those so that they can uh, really inform their decision about whether it's a good idea to package a car or not. Superannuation, next one on the list, that's um, fairly straightforward. Um, it's useful to give your employees a little bit of information about thresholds for concessional treatment, but drawing the line before you start giving them financial advice, of course. Um, always a good idea to just uh, advise your employees to get their own advice before they salary package any of these items. Airport lounge memberships are there because they're specifically exempt from FBT, so they're not for everybody and it's perhaps not something you'd put in your overall policy, but very easy to do if you do have employees travelling a fair bit and this is something useful for them. Living away from home allowances are also something that you might consider. Again, not necessarily in an overall policy for everybody because not everyone's going to qualify as living away from home. But where you do have staff in that scenario, then it's still possible to provide allowances as part of their package. Do need to be aware of the new rules, though. So we've limited now to qualifying for concessions only for one year for each employee in each particular location that they're living away from home. So um, just keep that in mind if you're setting something up. It should only last for a year, effectively. Um, relocation costs are another good one. So if an employee relocates in order to take up their position with you, with your organisation, or maybe they're going to move into state within your organisation, any of those moves that are permanent and are for the purposes of taking up a, uh, employment at the new location um, can have a bunch of the relocation costs treated as exempt from FBT. Now often the employer will pay for some of those transport and those type of, of costs, but the stamp duty cost on the purchase of a new home, something that the employer is not usually going to cover, but that can be quite an effective one to salary package because that is included as one of the items that's exempt from FBT. So the general requirement there is that the employee sell a previous home in the previous location and that must be sold within two years of the move and purchase a home in the new location within four years of the move. So provided they satisfy those criteria, packaging the stamp duty can be really useful. Remote area benefits is the next thing to um, look at, which really relates to scenarios where the employee, again, has moved into a remote location um, permanently. So this is not a living away from home scenario. This is a permanent move. So if the employee's moved into a remote area, there's lots of benefits that can be provided in respect to the housing that qualify for FBT exemption. Again, some of these might be provided by the organisation anyway, but if they're not, then it's something that the employee could salary package for. So in particular, the cost of renting housing itself, if you structure that the right way, it can be fully exempt from FBT. If you don't structure it the right way, it might be subject to FBT on 50% of the cost. Um, and what I mean by the right way is just who the rental um, or whose name the rental is in. So if the employer rents the accommodation and lets the employee live in it, that would be exempt from FBT. But if the employee rents it and then gets reimbursed, only 50% of the cost um, is going to be exempt, the other 50% taxable. So just need to set these arrangements up properly. There are some other criteria to satisfy as well. I should mention things like it being customary in the industry to provide these sorts of benefits and things. But certainly if you've got people in remote areas, the housing related benefits are a really good one to look at. So if that's the list of things that it makes sense to provide, how do we make sure that we're keeping things um, simple and, and easy to manage? 
So the first thing really is to think about whether you're going to manage this in-house or whether you need to engage a salary packaging provider to manage it for you. And obviously there are a number of administrators who've got all those, these sorts of things under control. So um, there's uh, lots, of, lots of choice, I suppose, in this regard. Um, if you're going to run an in-house system, that's where the following or the next two bullet points on that slide become relevant in terms of how you keep it really simple and easy to manage in-house. The first thing is that I would generally be looking at, um, I would generally advise that you look at reimbursing employees for their expenditure rather than paying the third party directly, just because you can reimburse the employee and put the payment through the payroll rather than having a whole lot of other providers that you're paying money off to. And also when you're reimbursing, you can do it at the same time through that pay run as the salary sacrifice that's coming out from the gross salary. So the two things kind of offset each other and no one ever owes anybody anything. So obviously there are exceptions to the rule because I was just talking about remote area housing where you would pay the landlord directly um, to ensure that you're exempt from FBT. But as a general rule, I think reimbursements make much more sense when you're running your own in-house system. Um, the other issue there is to, uh, in relation to keeping the admin easy, is to get the employees to substantiate their expenditure up front. And the point of this is that you don't want somebody having to keep a track of how much somebody's salary packaged and whether um, they need to still provide more substantiation to justify you know, what's been packaged to date. So if they have to provide all their receipts up front for what you're going to reimburse over the following period, you know that you've got it, you know what they're packaging over that period, no one's doing any chasing, there's no overs and unders, and the whole thing just becomes much, much simpler to run. So I strongly recommend that for an in-house system. And if you're trying to move to that sort of system, you might make the period a six-month period rather than a 12-month period, just to make it easier for the employee to come up with that substantiation um, up front. The reportable fringe benefits issue that I wanted to point out is about um, Making sure that the employees are aware that if they package benefits that are reportable on their payment summaries, that there'll be flow-on effects for them in term, potentially there'll be flow-on effects for them in terms of things like family tax benefit, child support payments, child care benefit, help repayments, lots of different government uh, benefits and levies that are means tested. And when you're packaging the meal entertainment and the venue hire, this is not such an issue because those things are specifically excluded, as is car parking, specifically excluded from the reporting on the payment summaries. But that $16,050 or the 30000 grossed up cap or 17000 if you're a hospital, etc., those sorts of benefits are reportable on the payment summary and they're reported at the full gross up rate equivalent to the highest marginal tax rate gross up. So, in other words, you're going to have a whole 30,000 reported if you're packaging the 16,050, but you've actually only given up, if you're with an exempt organisation, 16,000 of salary. So your reportable income has gone up by quite a bit through packaging these benefits. Now, you might find that the tax saving outweighs any detrimental effect of the higher reportable income, but that's an individual by individual decision and something that the employees just need to be made aware of before they enter into packaging arrangements to make sure they're, they're looking out for their best interests. Again, this is an area where you don't want to be providing financial advice to your employees, but you just need to be alerting them to the issues and encouraging them to get their own advice. Final point on this slide is really just to mention that the pooled cars scenario, um, these cars are not reportable on payments uh, summaries and what I'm talking about is when more than one employee has used the same car in the same FBT year, not reportable on either person's payment summary, but that doesn't take the car out of the FBT net itself. So it might still be subject to FBT for instance, if you're over the cap or whatever, but it's not reportable on the payment summary. Two different issues. Yeah, so the, the pooled car basically covers where more than one employee has used the car for private purposes in the same FBT year. So if an employee's got a novated lease, someone else is going to need to use that car and take it home overnight, for instance, for there to be a second user for it then not to be reportable on either person's payment summary at the end of the year. I 
the, they can't say that a novated lease just doesn't qualify for that exemption. Um, there was a thought that the tax office might have said novated leases don't qualify for this exemption um, from reporting because they can't know whether it's used by someone else. So uh, it's most likely that a novated lease car is allocated to a particular employee. They take it with them if they leave the organisation. It's not usual for someone else to be using the car for private purposes. So it's, it's usually a scenario where it's going to be reported on that employee's payment summary. But it is possible... Yeah, it's quite possible to give it to someone else to take home because they're thinking of buying that kind of car or something and they test, want to test drive it, take it home for the night. That will exclude it from reporting on both employees' payment summaries. Now, I've run out of time, so I just want to very quickly mention um, anything that I haven't mentioned so far in terms of not-for-profit reform going forward. I think I've covered most of it. I did want to just mention the unrelated business income tax thing. So this is something that was announced a while ago, and it's been deferred and deferred and deferred. And who knows if it's actually ever going to happen. But if it does, there's an FBT flow-on effect. This is about where you've got a not-for-profit who's got some commercial activities, usually fundraising activities, and the profits are channeled into the not-for-profit activity itself. There's a thought that in the future these sorts of activities might need to be separated off into separate entities. If that happens, those entities are likely to lose the FBT concessions and also GST concessions. So employees sitting in that part of the business won't be eligible for salary packaging. Um, like employees in the charitable part or the not-for-profit part would be eligible. So that's just something to have in the back of your mind in terms of activities that you might either have now or be thinking of down the track uh, in terms of structuring and, and just how you're going to be able to pay employees. So I've, I've run out of time now, so thanks for your attendance and I will hang around a little bit uh, at the end so if anyone's got some other questions that we haven't had time to cover so far.